This week on the Salesforce Admins Podcast, we are replaying an episode that we recorded last year with Emma Keeling about the skill of project management and some of the best practices that Emma uses to keep things organized. Now, back when we recorded this episode and the videos are still available, we launched a Skills for Success video series, which you can check out on our YouTube channel, and it's for admins. And so one of those skills was project management. And I feel it's an episode worth replaying. So I wanted to get that back in front of you because in 2024, project management, I promise you, is going to be a thing. Now, before we get into the episode, I want to be sure you're doing one thing, which is following the Salesforce Admins podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. That way, every Thursday, you'll get a new episode right on your phone. So with that, let's get to our conversation with Emma. Emma, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Mike. Well, I'm glad we had a chance to connect as, you know, part of the Skills for Success series. Jillian's having you on. And I also wanted to talk, too, because you're in the project management video, I'll say. But as you told me before I pressed record, you're not a project manager. So let's start there. What what do you do in kind of the Salesforce ecosystem? So in the Salesforce ecosystem, I'm effectively a Salesforce consultant. I um, started my life back in corporate hospitality, where I was the expert of a product that wasn't Salesforce. Mm -hmm. That then got um, migrated to being built on force.com. And I was the admin for that and suddenly had to become, you know, the Salesforce expert and you know, basically an accidental admin. And then after about three years, I kind of got to the point where I was the global product manager and they were starting to talk about moving me to onto other products that weren't Salesforce related. And at that point, I was like, no, because I want to do Salesforce and I also mm-hmm. want to stay hands-on. I don't just want to do product management as such. So that's what I did. I went freelance, started doing hospitality stuff, and then COVID hit, and that gave me a real good opportunity to kind of diversify, and I jumped in full feet into the nonprofit world. And, you know, we're now more than three years on, and that's going really well. And, yeah, so kind of I'm Salesforce consultant, but with that role comes a lot of project management right yeah so i'm currently spend about half of my time working with one client where i am the project manager for their salesforce implementation and i'm actually working with another partner which is really interesting so there's another partner on the other side actually doing the implementation and when i was asked to do that role they were like you know we've we've been recommended you for this and we're looking for a project manager. And I was like, awesome. I was like, I have project manager experience, but not your typical project manager. You know, I am not, I remember project managers when I was in the big corporate hospitality world, you know, and they were drawing their massive diagrams and they Mm -hmm. were, you know, timetabling it out to almost the minute and, I had more than one project manager telling me, you know, well, you can't now change your mind about that. I'm like, what? Like that decision that you made three months ago and you didn't really know what the product could do. But at that point, you said you were going to do X and you now want to do Y. You can't do that because it's not in the plan. And I was like, okay, so I'm like, I'm not one of them. I was like, I am. I'm more what I would say as a taskmaster. Uh Don't get me wrong, I can run to a timetable. We can sit and look at timings and work out, do they make sense? I can juggle diaries and that sort of thing. I can work with vendors and help timetable that in. But I, to me, that's a slightly different form. I almost feel like I'm more of what I would call an internal project manager. I'm not that external project manager you bring in who all they've ever done is big projects, you know, that are really needed in some of those, say, Fortune 500 companies, I'm sort of a slightly smaller scale project manager. 
You know, I was told very clearly by somebody that there's no way you'll manage to project manage this project in two days a week. And I was Mm. like, well, I'm like, let's see how it goes. And actually, it's gone very well. And we're actually going to deliver on time and on budget. So it's working. So you're a good project manager. And and I think, that, you know, that, like that's the reality of it. There's there's different levels of project management. There's the full on, like people that are dedicated, they come in, everything's a Kanban chart, a swim lane. They've got Gantt charts, like everything, right? That's their world. And then, you know, there's there's kind of everything in between all the way down to admins that just have to manage a lot of tasks. And I think project management is, you know, that's why we include it in the skills for success series. One of those things where exactly as you put it, how do we manage all of these tasks so that we're not overwhelmed and we get stuff done on time and hopefully like you on budget? Absolutely. And that's, I think, the real key like you say there are people who do this as a full-time job Mm -hmm. at that high level and interestingly you know the partner I'm working with on this particular project they have one of those people but actually she's also not full-time like she's working multiple projects but she's the person who's already managing you know a smart sheet where she's got all of those dates but then we just kind of dovetail in together because what I'm managing is kind of those priorities you know I'm right. managing a lot of organizational priorities and a lot of you know you talk about tasks so when I'm working with any of my clients on any of the work I'm working on whether that is just supporting an admin with some of their questions and almost being there kind of you know what's the word their person to just go to you know to kind of just bounce ideas off almost that there it is a little bit like that it's a bit like a it's like a consultant but it's like a it's literally consulting as in it I'm not necessarily building stuff I'm just uh-huh. helping them with their conversations I'm helping them with their is this the best way for me to do this you know I'm an admin sure. I'm a solo admin is this the best way to do this yeah and then you know so through that I'm managing tasks there and you know I'm very much you know you need somewhere to keep your tasks that you're never going to manage to keep everything in your brain or just on a notepad so I use ClickUp that's kind of my product of choice and in there I put all my tasks in there and they're all by client and you know they're there ready for me to go through add notes on copy and paste emails in you know there's loads more it can do but I kind of really just manage that and then I also have to being a consultant manage my time right so I attach time to them and I choose to use ClickUp just to be clear rather than Salesforce just simply from a potential growth perspective Salesforce Mm -hmm. licensing as we know can get a little bit pricey and I do get an org as a partner but I kind of went you know what ClickUp works somebody suggested it to me I'd seen it in action with somebody else and I was like you know what I'm gonna try that but you could easily do it in Salesforce, right? Um, particularly if you're a solo admin. I was going to say let let's start there, uh, kind of at, at the at the basement level. Um, you know, as a as a solo admin or or you know an admin that's maybe just spun up an org or doing all the implementation themselves. Kind of what were some of the things as a as a project manager? that when they put that hat on that they need to think about because, you know, there's there's a lot to do, right? There's new features, there's existing features that they need to roll out and maybe bugs, you know, uh, when, when Emma jumps in and, and, and kind of has to sort all that out, do you start by prioritizing things or, or where does you, where does your project management kind of start? So I guess it depends where you are are on what you're handling because I would say no project ever looks the same right but one of the key key things is people right figuring out what people you've got because if you're doing say an implementation you're probably not the expert on everything you know even if you're implementing a new feature as the Salesforce admin you may or may not be the expert on that feature You know, so if you're implementing something for fundraising, you're probably going to need to talk to the people in fundraising to find out what they really want. Mm -hmm. Also, are you starting from 
totally new, as in, you know, no one's ever documented any of this before, to actually there's a load of stuff here that somebody's written down and given me. So really that starting point is <laughs> almost figuring out where you're starting. So like, I have all the stuff. Let me take that away. Let me process it. Let me validate it. Or you're starting with conversations with people and you're really trying to understand, you know, the lay of the land, particularly even just with an organization, right? Right. You are going to have far more success with Salesforce with exec buy-in. Exec buy-in, I used to, I'll be honest, I used to scoff and be like, (laughs) yeah, really. No, 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 you really do. Um, You know, having that exec buy-in, and I would say almost that probably level below, depends how big the organization is, but that probably that level below. You want your exec to be on board, your, your top CEO, you want them to be well and truly on board, but you need a good foundation of people around that. And you need to know who your players are. You need to know whether they're, you know, pro Salesforce, anti Salesforce, whether they've got good technology knowledge or whether they, you know, maybe struggle a bit more with technology adoption. You want to be trying to get all of that sorts of information and really understand your people. And then you want to start understanding, like, what's key here? And you want to understand what's key right at the top of that organization or, as I say, at that, like, second level to really understand it's not the person who came to you first who wants something most importantly. It's not the person who shouts the loudest. You know, this is where it all kind of dovetails almost into that product management role that I historically did because you're really then kind of going, okay, so I've got somebody here in grants who says all these things are really important. But actually, when I talk to the person at the top, they're saying, no, 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 our focus at the moment isn't our outbound grants. It's our fundraising and getting our funds in. And that's where you've got to manage your people, right? So you've got to manage your people and be like, grants person, you're amazing. I love your energy. I love all your ideas. Let's take all of that. And then you start almost building out things like roadmaps, right? And you go from there. Now, this is where the world of like, let's say, project management, product management, just being an admin all collides. Because whose role is that? Is that one person's role? Is it lots of people's roles? You know, at least I would say if you're a small organization or maybe you're not, but there's just an admin and you kind of think, oh, my God, we really could do with more people. You still need to do a little bit of each of those. Because you've got to have somewhere where you're documenting what's important, where you're kind of reviewing what's important, and then where you're almost getting down those almost business as usual type tasks, right? And also then looking at things like timelines and dates, right? If you're being told that fundraising needs something for the holiday season, and if your holiday season, you know, if it starts 1st of November, let's say, um, that's a common date that I'm that's battered around in the UK. Sure. It's like first of November is when all this has to be in. Now, if you're in September and you're being asked for a massive piece of functionality, that's where you kind of have to do the pause and the. So, what did you do last year? Oh, okay. So you do have a solution in place. Do we want to do this? I have recently witnessed somebody try and roll out brand new donation pages in the middle of their biggest campaign period. <laughs> and they came to me and said, oh, there seems to be a problem. I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't project manage this one. I was just on the kind of sideline. And they came to me and they said, you know, we're having problems with these. And we're really worried it's impacting our campaign period. And my first question was what, well, my first point, I guess it wasn't even a question was, why would you do that now? Right. And I think that, is kind of also where your project management comes in, right? It's sitting down and saying, what else is happening in the organization? You know, the organization I'm working with at the moment is going through, we have three really busy periods a year in programs. So you know you've got to work around them. But do you have to totally work around them? I actually found out that the key person I needed in that team does a lot of work at other times of the year. Mm -hmm. Her work is not tied to those programs times. 
And it was really key that I figured that out because I initially was trying to block out time kind of going oh no we're not going to be able to use this person during this time and actually when I started talking to her she was like no no no, I can do that as long as I know in advance so I think that's a huge amount about project management right it's getting all those people knowing your people and getting them in the right place and knowing you know building relationships being able to go to somebody and say I need you to do this. And I know you don't really have time, but is there any chance you can do this? Because maybe something's moved forward in a project. Maybe something was delayed. Maybe something has just come up. You know, the people are really, really key. Yeah. I think, I think that's uh, an important aspect to, to, to bring up is too often. I think we forget when we're doing a new rollout or even adding a new feature, what other things are going on in the organization um, at the same time? And, you know, how will this adversely or, or not adversely affect somebody? Like, is it our slow period or is it our busy period? Because if it's your busy time, everything's got to work. You know, everybody's stressed out anyway. And then if you're rolling something else out on top of that, boy, what, what is the reception going to be like? I think that's a really great point to bring up, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And only last week I was chatting with a, a guy called um, Tim who um, does the human stack. Really mm-hmm. interesting concept of um, kind of not focusing on the digital, but focusing on the humans over the innovation and how that works. And really interesting. He's on LinkedIn and you know, people should go check him out. But what I saw, I was reading some articles and one of them was, um, it was basically a coffee cup where, you know, with an implementation or anything, like like you say, it could just be a new feature. Mm -hmm. You know, you're basically pouring more into that person's coffee cup. Mm -hmm. And actually what they need is a bigger cup. They, you know, they can't just keep taking on more and more. Right. But I think, Sometimes as a project manager, it's really key for you to ask that question. So ask the question of who is going to do this? Do we have time to do this? You know, do you have time to test this? You know, kind of those things that even though in a meeting, you know, I will, one of the things I will try and do is bring groups of people together so that I don't have to repeat the same conversation over and over again right and you also know that everybody then heard the same narrative so the project I've I'm currently working on you know we're about about 10 months in um it's going to have been about a 12 month project when it goes live and we've probably had big meetings I would say about every two months where we've really, I've brought up a timeline and I've looked at the next couple of sprints and just called out what is happening, who is responsible for what. And that might be as simple as it's our responsibility as the client versus it's the implementation partner's responsibility. Allowing people then to call up and go, actually, all my team's on holiday that week. Hmm for example, Mm -hmm. and you actually have that. But the other thing I've also cautious of doing is giving them a whole project plan and people going away and making full plans based on that when you're like, actually, some of those dates further down the line could be fluid. Right. So being a little bit cautious and making sure that things are caveated. And as much as people say, you know, don't write everything on a presentation slide, still writing stuff on a presentation slide that says TBC in brackets next to certain dates, just so that when somebody says, but you said the date for that training was going to be on that day, I can say, I did say it was to be confirmed, right? you know, and allowing you that space to breathe. Because actually, a lot of what happens in a project isn't necessarily down to the project manager. Even if you are the solo admin, right? So you could be the solo admin who's working on a new piece of functionality, who then gets pulled into another piece of work that really is an organizational priority. So I know somebody who works in a charity 
um, to do with children affected by war. Now, you can imagine when the war in the Ukraine started, Mm -hmm. they got very much their organisational priorities changed, right? So that isn't the project manager's fault or the admin's fault when actually that piece of functionality doesn't happen. That's something outside of their control. You know, we all face this with COVID, but that can happen on a lower level. People People are sick, right? So you also need to bake in time. You need to bake in time for like, what if somebody's sick? What if somebody isn't available to test? Is there a backup person? Can that backup person test? And is their output valid? Because I've worked on many projects where one person will say, yes, that's absolutely fine. And they maybe aren't the main decision maker. Main decision maker comes back and says, ooh, sorry, but I'm not happy with that decision. And you kind of go, okay, well, we asked and you said the other person could make the decision, but okay, this is real life. And you have to be willing to pivot, right? And you can't be responsible for everything. When somebody's son is sick and they can't make it into the office that day, there's nothing you can do about it. And I'm always very clear with whoever I'm working with, you know, whoever I'm reporting into, let's say, whether that's my client, whether that when I was internal, if that was my manager, you know, I would I would almost make that quite clear of like, I can only be fully responsible for this to a point. So, you know, especially when I work with clients, I have to kind of highlight, I I can't force your team to do this. I can give them all the tools to fish, <laughs> teach them to fish. I can, I can get on a call with them and sit with them while they do testing, say. Mm-hmm. But if they didn't want to come to the call, I can't. Right. You know, so there's, there's kind of a level where you have to say, there's only so much I can do. And also how much do you want me to do? Because when you look at a client, they might not want to pay you for all that time. Um, And even internally, you know, if you're an internal admin, they might not want you to spend hours just sitting with users while they're going through testing. So that's kind of where you need that exec, right? You need that next level up. You need that next level where we say, you know, hey, team, this needs testing. You've been sent all the information. You've been sent a deadline. Please work towards that deadline please let us know if there are any problems you almost need that like backstop right right and that backstop can't always just be you i talk a little bit about playing good cop bad cop i also find i kind of need to be good cop as much as i can be don't get me wrong sometimes i have to play bad cop and i have to be like no sorry that doesn't work and in some roles that's you know more of a requirement than others but Sometimes you you have to figure out who you need to keep on side, right? And if you know that you need to have a team be really happy and you kind of have to, maybe they're under a lot of pressure, maybe they've got people off sick, maybe they're down a team member because somebody moved on to another role, you sometimes don't want to be the person who has to say the final no. And I don't always think that that's, a bad thing that you need to bring somebody else in who maybe says, hey, guys, you know, I don't think we can do it like that. Or, um, you know, hey, team, let's mm-hmm. let's think about moving that back. Can we move it back a month? You need people to help you with those conversations. Yeah. When you think through the the skill of project management, because, you you, you know, you, you do this for as a consulting um, and admins manage projects a lot, too. What would you say are the three most important things that you've learned that help you successfully manage a project? Now, that's an interesting question because I obviously did the video with Jillian Uh um, that kind of goes with this. And I can guarantee that whatever I said in that video is going to be completely different to what I say now. (laughs) And there's a reason for this, right? Because Uh there are that many skills that I had to pick out what skills I was going to talk about in that video. So I would say our top skills, at least how I feel today, let's say, are, I think, people skills. 
-hmm. And you can intertwine that with things like leadership, right? Mm -hmm. I think strong people skills, being able to talk to people, being able to understand people, being able to understand what motivates people, you know, even down to things like, are the people in your team people who are there early in the morning and that's when they have great time or are they the sort of person who are, you're better getting on a call or are they the sort of people you can just send a Slack message to and they'll just be like, yep, send over some more information in text form. I'm fine with that. You know, really being able to understand people is important. I think it is very important that you can understand time and budget. So being able to understand how long do I have for this piece of work? You know, how much money do we have? And then be able to also convert that into what does that look like at the end? Because if I have a low budget, but we really need this sort of functionality, in what ways can we achieve that? Is there a lower cost way to achieve it? You know, can we build an MVP? You know, that minimum viable product. Can we do that instead? Do, how? And, and actually, if that isn't going to meet our use case, do we build anything at all? You know, do we actually go back to the drawing board and we go back to the leadership and we either A, ask for more money, or if you've already got to the point where you know there isn't the more money, do you go back and say, hey, do you know what? Maybe we're better to start with something else. Maybe we're better not to do priority one on the list because maybe we need a round of funding for that or maybe we need to wait until our budget comes in for next year or maybe we've got another in-house resource who can work on that, but they're working on another project. You know, try and figure out where are we best placed to use that money and use that time. And then I think the last thing, is probably, and I'm toying here between, is it important to be able to use tools and software and that sort of thing, or is it important to have industry knowledge? I would say if I have to put it in a top three, I mean, they're both equally as important, so I'm going to push mm -hmm. it to four. Um, so I would say, you know, you've got to be able to manage your time as a project manager. Like if you can't keep track of, your tasks and what you're doing. If you don't remember to send out the email, if you don't remember to chase somebody, if you don't manage to collaborate effectively in JIRA or Google Sheets or whatever that is, you can't really expect to be able to bring everybody else along, you know, for the ride, right? So you've got to be able to do that. And then I think the last thing really is that industry knowledge. Now, don't get me wrong, I've worked with some very, very good project managers who actually their industry knowledge was much lower. But you end up caveating that with a lot of time spent with them learning from subject matter experts to be able to have those questions, to be able to talk about a product or a solution or an industry, and particularly the industry. You know, if don't get me wrong, it can work. And as I said, I've been in the nonprofit space now for about three and a half to four years. So I'm not going to say I know everything about nonprofits. I don't. And I try and ask a lot of questions to learn more. But you really have to up that knowledge. And I think to be successful, you need to learn about that industry or at least be willing to learn. I find it very difficult with project managers who suggest they don't need to know anything about the industry to be successful in it, because I just don't think that's the case. Yeah, I would find that hard. And, and the same would go for, um, you know, I had some great discussions in community groups too about, you know, I, I want to be a Salesforce admin. What industry should I be in? I'm like, well, an industry that you're aware of and, and are familiar with because, you know, otherwise you're, you're really setting yourself up for a steep learning curve, thinking that through of having to learn the industry as well, you know? 
Yeah, totally. And I think if you are going into maybe a role where you're in a team and you maybe don't know that, you can, you maybe get a faster ramp up, right? Because people around mm-hmm. you can help bring up that knowledge. And I think if you apply for a role and you don't have that, and I think you then just have to be very clear with people, right? Like, I don't have the knowledge about this, but I want to learn. So please tell me more or please tell me where I can find out about this. I've even found things like over the lunch table discussions helpful. Like when I've been on site with a client and you sit and have lunch and you can be like, hey, tell me a bit more about, you know, legacy donations and legacy donors and where that comes from and how does that work and how do you find legacy donors, for example. You know, that was a really interesting discussion. And at the end of it, I was like, wow, I actually learn loads and I can then share that knowledge but I think if you don't have industry knowledge yeah you really need to make sure that people you're working with do or that it's quite accepted that you don't and you need time for that so you need to factor that in right like I once I once went and did a piece of work in a financial services company Um, it was only a short piece of maternity cover I'd never wanted to work in that sector and I was right. I didn't enjoy working in that sector, if I'm honest. But what I did find was I was able to ask the right questions because I've done stuff historically where maybe I haven't known the answer. So I've had to ask lots of questions. But it was it was challenging. It was challenging. And the people who knew I didn't have the knowledge, that was okay because they made sure that they started discussions with explanations of why we're doing this, how, you know, What's, why is it important? And you have to ask all those whys. Where I was put into conversations with people who didn't know I didn't have the industry knowledge, that was really difficult because people immediately assume that you do have that knowledge and they aren't always receptive to the fact that you don't. So I would say definitely steep learning curve. Like yep. Try and start somewhere where you've got knowledge and or at least be clear with people that you don't have the answers. Yeah, absolutely. Emma, you've done a really great job of exposing us to some of the things that you do and don't do as a as a project manager and, and thinking about project management as a skill. So uh, I feel this was a, a very good compliment to the, the video that you put out with Jillian. So I uh, appreciate you taking time out to be on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Mike. It's been fun. Yeah. Thanks so much. That was a great conversation with Emma. I think she really brought out a lot of things. Boy, one part that you always have to think about is how much other change is going on in the organization as well. So now if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to share it with one person. If you're listening on iTunes, just tap those dots and choose share episode. Then you can post it to social. You can text it to a friend. I'd really appreciate it. And of course, if you're looking for more great resources, your one stop for everything admin is admin.salesforce.com, including a transcript of the show in case you missed anything. So be sure to check that out and join our conversation in the Admin Trailblazer group in the Trailblazer community. Don't worry, the link is in the show notes. And with that, until next week, we'll see you in the cloud. <laughs>